It's my real pleasure to be here with you today to contribute to this session with myself and Jonathan Rigg. And um, I'm particularly interested in sharing with you some untold stories from current research that's happening in northern Peru, albeit with me at a distance um, in these lovely hallowed grounds of St Andrews that you can see there in, in the back of the picture. Um, I'm going to share with you two sets of work and this first picture, um, it's almost like a guessing game as, as to what this is. Um, this is a, a set of satellite images um, from the Sentinel-2 uh, image centre and this shows the, uh, the area around the Sechura Desert uh, at the time of the 2017 El Niño, what became known as the El Niño Costero. And you can see on the far left, it looks like lots of yellow sand, lots of desert. And by March, um, so just a couple of months later, you've got appearing from al almost nowhere, the Laguna La Nina there to the south. Um, and uh, two years later, it is still there. And what I want to focus on uh, in today's talk really is the appearance of uh, these lagoons in the middle of, of the desert of northern Peru and to ask ourselves um, what this means um, for the untold stories of uh, farming and fishing in the desert. And this is research that we've been carrying out um, in northern Peru with a couple of NGOs, uh, Peruvian NGOs, Prisma and SIPCA, as well as the uh, two Peruvian universities, the University of Pura and the Agricultural University. And what we're really interested in this work is trying to find out for how long and uh, with what sort of levels of creativity these deserts environments and the people living in them have been coping uh, with El Nino. And then the second part of what I want to share with you is um, some work that literally is hot off the press yesterday uh, about what's happening to these rural livelihoods in northern Peru, both on the coast and into the mountains um, in the context of COVID-19. And I really want to try to pull out whether what we're seeing is uh, old stories of people taking advantage of opportunities of sort of um, unexpected rainfall, for example, or unexpected uh, negative events um, in order to build on solidarity networks to enable their livelihoods to, to go forward. And that work will be drawing on um, work in also in the province of, of, the, of Pura, this northern part of Peru, but we'll go into the uh, mountain areas and those uh, three, four regions there coloured in green. So all of this work then is current work uh, and it's set in northern Peru and it both projects are trying to look at how people themselves are, are struggling to do more than make the best of the scenarios that they're currently experiencing. So why El Nino and why now? Well, I thought it was really interesting that as Peru was coming out of lockdown um, in June, there was a high publicity event in Peru advertising the fact that the British government um, have signed a, an agreement with the Peruvian government to help rebuild uh, northern Peru after the devastation of 2017. So we're talking, you know, quite a few years later that this area has still, the infrastructure has still been very negatively affected by the El Nino or what became known as the El Nino Costero, the El Nino from the sea, from the coast. And uh, you can see the lovely pictures there of the signing in, in face masks. And um, this really important funding from the British government, I, you know, I don't want to uh, suggest that it isn't, very much does follow the pattern of El Nino being seen as a disaster nar narrative. And what I'm trying to do with this uh, talk is to get you to think beyond just a disaster narrative at other sorts of livelihoods that might also uh, be happening and have been happening for a long time but are not talked about. Okay, so that's the main point of, of the first part of what I'm going to say. Now, the El Nino is a, is a phenomenon that really features greatly in the Peruvian imaginary and past El Ninos are frequently evoked when it seems like there might be a, an other El Nino due. So generally it's a cyclical pattern of unexpected rains coming um, from the Pacific onto the coast, which is otherwise a desert, desert and causing absolute devastation. And, and this goes back to sort of well before uh, colonial times into pre-colonial um, cultures um, and shaped many of the early civilizations of northern Peru. And this sort of cyclical rains happens generally about every five years. So this idea then of El Nino as a disaster 
uh, is, as I suggested, evoked in order to make people think about what might be coming further down the line. And this is a, a newspaper article from 2016 where they were fully expecting there to be another big El Nino and it evokes the findings um, about the El Nino in 97 and 98 in the area where uh, more than uh, a million 250,000 people were affected by the floodings um, and uh, more than 225,000 homes were also affected throughout Peru. So at the beginning of 2016, when in fact we were hoping to do some work in the region, um, there were all these sort of uh, augurings of a really, really bad El Nino. However, it didn't happen. But what did happen was in 2017, an El Nino year that wasn't meant to happen, there was this new phenomenon called El Nino Costero, which absolutely devastated northern Peru. And it's that reconstruction that the um, British government is now co-financing uh, co and co-involved with through a public-private partnerships in Peru. And what is interesting about this El Nino is it's not quite the same as the one from 83 and 78. This El Nino Costero, the only other one in recorded time that is similar, uh, is from 1925. And I won't go into the technical differences, but it's to do with different points of heating and cooling um, and the proximity to the coast of that, um, that whether or not this, this is a formal El Nino or a slightly different phenomenon. So, when people first sort of saw the El Nino in 2017, they were saying, oh my goodness, you know, we weren't expecting this. And then people started to look back at climate records. And that's when uh, in, in the same year, the association was made with uh, the previous event in 2000, uh, 1925, sorry. And uh, you can see here, I love this old picture, uh, and I'm very grateful to uh, Luz Maria Hilguero for, for these photographs. Um, the picture on the left is uh, an original picture from 1925 that shows the flooding of the main plaza in the city of Piura in the north, province of Piura in the north of Peru, and the same plaza uh, in 2017 with uh, the police helping a woman out of the same flooded streets. And the bridge to the right that was devastated, the, the so-called new bridge devastated in 2017, replaced an earlier older bridge that had also been uh, devastated through previous El Ninos. So this, what I'm trying to say here is that this phenomenon of El Nino and the north of Peru having to deal with it is absolutely nothing new. And if we look at the archives, both sort of recent archives and uh, colonial archives, we see that all of them show historic periods of destruction. And um, this is a collection, it's an amazing archive by the NGO SIPCA um, in northern Peru, uh, originally a, a Jesuit NGO, that have collected newspapers um, from uh, the early 1900s, national and local. And, and what we did as a research group is we went through these newspapers and tried to see how often uh, El Niños were covered. And we got extensive coverage of the 83 uh, Niño, El Niño and, and the 97-98 El Niño. And we were able to look at what were the major representations about those El Niños. Did they talk about disaster or did they also talk about other things? And similarly, uh, the picture there of the academic article refers to some of the uh, really fascinating work that's been done on uh, colonial archives and Republican archives that seek to trace patterns of tributes and taxes to show whether or not there has been an El Niño year or not. I mean, they didn't use the word El Niño um, back then, but these archives have been used to identify similar phenomenon. And so therefore we can trace it through the written archive as well as through the archeological archive uh, of um, Northern Peru from pre-Columbian societies. Now, that story of devastation, however, is not the full story. When we looked very hard at the newspaper articles, we did find some examples of people, everyday people, uh, not necessarily the city dwellers, but the small town dwellers, um, getting together and trying in acts of solidarity to cope with the El Nino events of 83 and also 98. And um, these newspaper articles here are, for, uh, are actually from 83. And it's really interesting to me that they use at the bottom a language of indigenous collective forms of working, la minca, um, in order to show how people were coming together uh, through acts of collective labor to try to rebuild the infrastructure at the time. So that is people of Pura revive the minca tradition. And 
On the coastal areas, these traditions haven't been there for hundreds of years, maybe in the mountains, but the fact that they're even using this language is quite important. And the article to the left was one of the few that we found uh, that referenced the place where we've done empirical fieldwork, where we went and we did uh, interviews and also took samples of the lake, a community called Cristo Nos Valga, Christ Saves Us, which probably seemed quite appropriate uh, as a name at the time. Um, but this talks about them going out onto the street, streets with uh, a, sort of a big pickaxe and, and, uh, and various utensils in order to move away the boulders. Um, to redirect the channels of the water, but also to make the uh, agricultural land worthy again. So this archival work then was what then, uh, from a research point of view, made me question, well, OK, if it's there in the archives, surely it's there in everybody's living memory. Let's go and find out what actually happens in the desert at the time of El Nino. What, what, what did these people do? Was it just a disaster for them or was there something more that motivated this collective form of activity? And you can see here, this is uh, the same picture of the satellite images. And this is the La Nina Lake that appeared uh, in the middle of the desert. And what the story we started to hear, both in relation to fishing and farming, was a story of uh, abundance, not a story of disaster. Now, these are communities of very, very marginalized people um, who live very much uh, hand to mouth. They don't have a lot of um, financial networks to support them, um, but who for generations at a time of El Nino have been able to take advantage of uh, rains coming into the desert. And you can see um, from that quote that I, I'm sure you've, you've already read um, that basically there was a whole system of people being taken to the lake doing the fishing and, and uh, collecting the fish. Now, these, these rafts are fascinating. Um, these are the same artisan rafts that are used on inshore fishing uh, off the coast of Peru. And at the time of El Nino, the same rafts get transported to the lakes and the same fishermen transfer some of their skills to the lakes. But what is also interesting is in the lake here, you'll see just below the nets that some of the wooden planks have been replaced by that plastic guttering um, because it's lighter and easier to transport. So it's an innovation. And what the guys were saying to me is that by innovating in the lake, they also started to innovate in the sea by using some plastic tubing in the sea as well. But there, because of the waves, they have to be a bit careful about the ratio of plastic um, to, to wood. So we see already then a sort of a link between this desert inland lake and sea coastal fishing practices. And this here is a, a, a picture taken from uh, earlier this year when that same um, La Nina Lake had actually dried up. You could see it very, very much in the distance there, but even up to about six months before, uh, there was still water in this part of the lake. And when we walked along here, we could see skeletons about this big of uh, mullet fish that as the lake dried and, um, and, and became increasingly salty, uh, were left stranded. And interestingly, the fishermen told us they weren't allowed to catch those fish and sell them even though they knew they were going to die because they didn't meet the requisite length of a fish that could be sold in the market because these fish are also fished in the sea and to prevent over overfishing there's a, a particular length at which you can you can catch a fish so there's sort of development challenges um, in there so the same story then is also true of raining in the desert and um, this is beautiful picture of, of corn that, that we saw growing that previously had not grown on this piece of land. And the same farmer um, who uh, was a, a fisherman as well, um, you know, taking advantage of the waters when they were there, basically told us how in the period he would use some of the fishing to save money for his agriculture and therefore his agriculture for, for the fishing. And this was very much a period of a few years in and around the El Nino year. And um, one of the things that is also really interesting is this area is uh, also a mining area for phosphates. So it's very, very rich minerally. And some of the farmers were saying that there's a, a big area of commercial cotton growing around here. 
And the farmers were saying that in parts of the desert that were completely dry, when the rains came, the cotton came up all by itself on their land and they were able to harvest it uh, without having to even plant it. And certainly they could do a second crop without then having to put, put in any additional fertilizers. And so this is, and they competed with the commercial um, uh, cotton uh, crop at this time for, 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 for a period of two seasons. And this is really high, high quality Peruvian cotton. So this then is a story of being happy about the rains. It's not a story uh, that is just about devastation. And equally, um, there are also new markets that get open up. You can see the fishermen there by the lake uh, cleaning out the mullet. And um, when we talk to them about where they sell their products, um, obviously, that you know, Lima is the biggest capital and it's the biggest market. Chiclayo is, is a city further to the south as well. Um, but when I asked them, well, why don't you sell in Pura? They said that the prejudices in Pura were that this was seen as coming from the lake to be dirty contaminated fish and so these sort of local prejudices around what is good food and what is bad food um, almost as if what's on your local doorstep can't be anything good um, fed into how that how they were able to value the product or not and so they they were able to sell the product far more easily um, in Lima and a huge amount of the, of the product um, so these now many of these fishermen in the time of COVID have been using their savings also to build um, houses in order to be rented out as an income um, in a drier period. So they're using the accumulated capital uh, in order to make an, an investment in the Satura region. So just to summarize the, 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 where we are with this research, I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm covering quite a lot of ground here. But the point I'm trying to make is that the general narrative of disaster in this area is not the full story. There is a long, long history going back to pre-Columbian time of people coexisting with El Nino and actually taking benefit from El Nino. And on, on a societal level, um, we also saw examples of the fishermen from, from the sea organizing themselves in order uh, to be able to uh, work together in the same way in the same bands of, of, of people uh, in the lakes. We saw extended family groups working together. And there was also a really interesting example of one community um, who back in 83 were displaced during, uh, they were a coastal community, displaced during El Nino, moved to a community more inland in the desert, still worked as sea fishermen, but they particularly took great advantage and, and were key players in, in the fishing of the lake fish as well. The other thing we saw is that the gender divisions around this. So at the time of El Nino, it's all hands uh, to the plough and to the markets. So all family members would take part in different forms of agriculture. Um, but particularly on the marketing of the fish, the stuff that didn't go to Lima, the wives and daughters, particularly of the fishermen, uh, the daughters before school would go and sell the fishing in, in their local communities. So a very much joined up um, set of practices then. But it does, for me as an academic, leave me with a series of questions and challenges, particularly in the context of, you know, the big push for reconstruction uh, and, and, and big um, anti-flooding measures being um, uh, rolled out in the north of Peru. There is a real urgency uh, in the context of climate change to think about how uh, food systems can be propagated within fragile environments. And what we're seeing here and that, the, that all the predictions are that in the north of Peru and in the coastal areas, the rains will increase with climate change. Whether that's El Nino or whether it is uh, rains anyway, the, the rains in the north that fall on the mountains uh, are going to increase. There is evidence to su suggest, and this is also part of a project that my physical colleagues um, are doing on, on the project, to see that with climate change, El Nino is becoming more frequent and more intense. So th these lakes, basically, these lagoons are going to last longer and they're not going to go away. So how can we ensure then that the voices of the people who have been managing the, these systems, these food systems and these ecosystems for hundreds and possibly thousands of years are actually listened to and capitalised upon in reconstruction? How do we ensure that the reconstruction doesn't just focus on 
big dams and big irrigation channels taking the water away from the city and out to the sea and, and in effect cutting off potential benefits and livelihoods to these very marginalized people. And one of the things, a key focus of our project, which I'll come back to uh, in a bit, is working with the NGO Prisma, is we're trying to ensure that intergenerational knowledge about El Nino is not lost and is passed through generations and is included within the school curricula. So the second thing then I want to uh, point to is what is happening generally in northern Peru to rural livelihoods in the context of COVID. And you probably saw in the news um, just how much India and Peru are the two places that have been highlighted with the mass movement of people leaving cities and uh, returning to their rural routes. Um, in, in Peru, you know, Lima is a huge city, up to 10 million is the population, with a very much an informal economy and uh, people not having permanent jobs. So they were hit hugely, first generation migrants, maybe who'd been there for up to 20 years, were hit hugely uh, by lockdown when it carried on. OK, and you can see here, this is lockdown in this six weeks. So into the last week of April and the first week of May was when we saw the large scale movement of people, including back to um, northern Peru and to Pura. So as I suggested at the beginning, hot off the press is this brand new um, study that we just finished on um, return migration to the mountainous area of uh, the uh, the, uh, of Pura province. Um, uh, you can see there the places off to the right. Th those are the mountain regions and uh, Pura cities on the coast. And you can see the coast of the Satura Bay um, off to the left. And what we did in the context of lockdown, working closely with colleagues uh, in Sipka who've been working in this area for many years, is we did the first study um, sort of rigorous study on the processes of return migration, who returns, how and why, and with what intentions. And these are some very, very preliminary results that I wanted to share with you just, just because, you know, it seemed like an ideal opportunity. And as a good geographer, I love a couple of maps. And the, these maps actually show something that otherwise isn't really being talked about in the Peruvian context. The focus very much has been on those large scale movements from Lima. Um, but what we can see in, in, the, in the map to the left is, yes, the patterns of arrival to, to the mountainous areas of northern Peru are from Lima. They're even from the jungle areas of Manaus and they're from further south on the coast. But if you look to the diagram on the right, the intensity of the movement is also from within the region. Now, this is really important for local government planning and regional government planning. This suggests it's not just people coming from the main city, but that actually the movement back to rural areas and rural routes was also from an immediate um, uh, hinterland often but not only associated with, with, with seasonal work, but also because of the close ties between um, uh, work opportunities on the coast and uh, rural homelands, even if those rural homelands haven't been visited for a decade or maybe more. So why do people do this? Well, you can see uh, in the quote there, this is mass scales of people moving from uh, Lima. Um, and basically, they know that even if they won't have money, they will be able to live. Now, initially, uh, what we saw was evidence of solidarity. That the, the study shows that the Rondas Campesinas, those are local uh, social movements organized by, by, by the farmers to sort of do community patrols, local government and regional governments, police and the health services all work together to enact quarantine, initially even to send food parcels for the, before the first six weeks of, of people moving. But slowly, what we started to see is particularly the local government and the regional government falling away or not delivering on their promises of uh, funding. So that left the Rondas Campesinas quite exposed to be delivering and policing um, both quarantine, but also the reintegration of people into communities. And looking longer term, what we're starting to see, you'll see some of the statistics of who these people are off, off under the photograph there. But Looking forward, what we're seeing is that basically 
people who've moved back in the 35 plus years with with particularly with young children even if they've been in Lima for 15 20 years or in other coastal cities for 15 20 years are deciding to stay to forget their dreams of um, a Dick Whittington city experience and to actually recognize that there's been a break in their migration trajectory and to stay and try to make a living uh, in their rural areas We've got quotes about people living in, in multiple households within one households, about people not really being able to tr find much work. Um, one man, even to get the money to travel back, um, talked about having to go and work illegally on a fishing boat to the south of Lima, even just to get the amount of money to travel back with his family. One really interesting finding is that some of the most vulnerable people are married women who aren't from the area, who've basically returned with their husbands, but they don't know anybody. They met their husband maybe 15, 20 years ago uh, in, in uh, Lima or in another city, and now they're suddenly in this alien environment to them, and they've got no way of supporting themselves or their family. So these are just some, some hints then about some of the challenges going forward. And with the final couple of slides, um, what I want to turn to is a reflection on what this attention to rural livelihoods under COVID has actually shown me as a researcher. The first is the real need to have proper partnerships with researchers and activists and NGOs in the country where the experience is happening. Now, this has been the hallmark of my work, but I've never ever known how important it is really until now. I mean, I miss, don't get me wrong, I really miss being in Peru. But the quality of the research relationships means that we could very quickly put together a response to COVID and, and uh, funded by the Scottish Funding Council GCRF money and get research done on the ground. And that is really important. Secondly, is the importance of storytelling about the past and present so that we can render more visible the opportunities and solidarities that are missed. Now, this was part of our original El Nino proposal. We were always going to do oral histories, intergenerational oral histories with school kids. But once COVID hit, we had to get innovative about this and completely change what we were going to do. I no longer had the opportunity to go and sit and, and chat with these kids myself. So what we did is we worked very closely with the local school. You can see the director up there in the picture with our research assistant, Oliver Kaye. And the project funded computer tablets uh, in order for the children to learn how to get online, to learn how to engage even with an online curricula that the state in Peru was desperately trying to get off the ground in very, very challenging circumstances. And what those children did is they, they would go out to wherever they could get Wi-Fi. We, we provided them with SIM cards, so wherever they could get Wi-Fi through the SIM. They would have their training, a series of six trainings on how to use the phone to do research, the tablet, how to do research and how to actually conduct oral histories, how to take good photographs. These were secondary school kids. And I joined in on some of these sessions and I will never forget this one little lassie who'd gone off to the one part of her chakra of her farm that was slightly up the hill in the desert where she could get a signal. And I could hear the goats in the background while she was showing her photographs that she had taken and then was telling the teacher um, what they told her about what her grandfather had done previously and how he managed in the 83 El Nino. So what this has really shown me is the importance of partnership and how we need to get innovative about research if we want to make a difference. And in terms of making a difference, um, you know, Peru, like here, is struggling to get online for its delivery of education. The private sector, obviously, has had more funding, has been able to do a lot better than the state sector. Um, but our colleagues at the school um, that we were working with in Malavida in Sechura, the social science teacher, Nancy, you can see here in the picture, she actually put this forward, this experience of these oral histories with 12 children and their family uh, just a couple of weeks ago for a competition uh, held by the local school board, the regional school board in, in, in Sechura, so 21,000 pupils in, in, in that school board, uh, and they won. OK, they won the competition for showing uh, an innovation in education in the context of an online curricula through this research project.
And I had never been more proud of working in collaboration with colleagues at that point. And my colleagues in Prisma were very much the people who had first initiated this, working with the UGEL, the school board, and with this particular school. And I've put there that title, Development, Voice, Power and Identity in Global Times, because that's the title of an honours module I'm currently teaching at St Andrews. And it is all about, OK, where do people have voice in development these days? And I put that there because I want to finish with the words of Nancy when she was questioned um, by the panel for why she had called what she was doing with the school kids storytelling. So they talked about these oral histories of storytelling and they used the word in English of storytelling. And um, this was questioned and Nancy turned round and said, look, just because my students are poor, they need to be as prepared as much as anybody and if not more so for employment in a globalized workspace. They need to feel able and confident to use terms in whatever language or the currency that explains a particular phenomenon. They need to know storytelling in English, in French and in Spanish. They need to know these global terms because they are the next generation who will be going into a global marketplace. And that for me, uh, is a wonderful example of the sorts of things I've been trying to tell my students at St Andrews about how we see empowerment in the context um, of development and particularly for the next generation of researchers who will be coming from Satura and not just St Andrews. So this is a thank you um, to our partners, our collaborators and funders. Uh, they're all there and uh, there's Paddington Bear because he came with us on the first time we went to do the research um, in Peru because my colleagues' uh, children had seen him going to the Royal Geographical Society. So thank you. <laughs>